Um, I will get started with an introduction, but please feel free to keep saying hello. So the, today's webinar is titled Pioneers, Remembering the First Jews in America. I'm Ari Goldstein, Senior Public Programs Producer at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust in New York City, and it's a pleasure to welcome you. Jews with origins in Spain, North Africa, and Arab lands make up a small minority of the American Jewish community, but the stories of these communities are essential to understanding our shared national Jewish identity, and especially to understanding the evolution of anti-Semitism long before the Holocaust. So we're delighted to be able to present today's program, which will explore the fact that these immigrants represent the very beginnings of the American Jewish story. And we're grateful to be doing it alongside our wonderful partners, American Friends of Beit HaTzvitzot and the Jewish Heritage Alliance, and with our esteemed panelists who will be introduced shortly. We hope you'll walk away from today's conversation with a deeper understanding of American history, Jewish history, and the world. Please feel free to share questions and comments anytime during the program via the Zoom chat. Now I'll hand things off to my colleague, Shua Bahad. Thank you, Ari, and good afternoon, everybody. My name is Shulan Mid Bahat, and I'm CEO of Beta Futsot of America, representing the Israel-based Museum of the Jewish People, which was founded 43 years ago and just concluded the renewal of the core exhibition and other educational cultural platforms and a new website, all dedicated to the noble mission of telling the entire unique and ongoing story of the Jewish people, past and present, to people of all backgrounds the world over. An important chapter of our story is the theme, theme of today's uh, program. The enterprise is so meaningful and important that there is a special unanimous, and I underline unanimous, law of the State of Israel that designates Beta Kfutzot as a natural, national center of Jewish communities in Israel and abroad. It is a global uh, um, entity. Our core, our new core exhibition, which miraculously will be completed and ready to open this coming Hanukkah, will make the venue the largest museum of its kind in the world. It will emphasize the light and shadows of our history and the journey through time, the diversity of our people, uh, the thriving for unity, not uniformity necessarily, the foundation of, you and, uh, uh, and of Jewish life, and it will require eventually, in my opinion, a, a lifetime to see it, um, the alternatives are Aliyah and, uh, or maybe a boutique hotel uh, on premises. I want to thank our partners, which Ari has uh, mentioned, and my colleagues in uh, Israel and in the American Friends of Better Food Thought, and all of the distinguished and prominent panelists and moderators that are going to carry on the content of this program. So enjoy it. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for your interest and participation. My name is Michael Steinberger. I am founder and CEO of Jewish Heritage Alliance, a platform dedicated to promoting the Sephardic experience. The word Sephardic in Hebrew literally means Spain, but in historical context, Sephardic refers to the Jews of the Iberian Peninsula, nowadays Spain and Portugal. The story of Sephardic is a monumental far-reaching segment of Jewish and world history with profound consequences. But for all of its significance and relevance, the story of Sfarad seems to lack the attention it truly deserves. So I started Jewish Heritage Alliance with the mission to recover and promote the story of Sfarad on a global scale. Today's presentation is about the early arrival of Jews to America. These early pioneers were descendants of Sfarad, one of the many interesting and compelling effects relating to the history of Sfarad. To learn more about the Sfarad narrative, please visit our website or follow us on Facebook or the other social media platforms and enjoy today's presentation. Thank you. Well, um, thank you for that. And thank you for inviting me to be the moderator for this amazing talk. And I'm gonna introduce the panelists right now. So we have um, Andre Brooks, and she's an award-winning New York Times journalist and lecturer on Jewish history. She's a board member of the Gomez Mill House in Marlboro, New York, 
the only Jewish house museum in America connected to a colonial Jewish merchant. Andre is the author of The Woman Who Defied Kings, The Life and Times of Doña Gracia Nazi, a Jewish leader during the Renaissance. We also have uh, Jane Gerber. Dr. Jane Gerber is the founder and director of the Institute of Sephardic Studies at the Graduate Center of the City, City University of New York. Her books include Jews of Spain, A History of Sephardic Experience, and Jewish Society in Fez. Uh, with us today also is Joseph Lovett. He is the notable filmmaker and director of the documentary Children of the Inquisition. Joe has been honored with numerous awards, including the Peabody and an Emmy nomination. Children of the Inquisition premiered at the Seattle Film Festival festival in March 2019 and follows a diverse group of descendants of Spanish and Portuguese Inquisition uh, of the Spanish and Portuguese Inquisition as they unravel their complex and often hidden Jewish identities. And finally, we have uh, Dr. Jo Jonathan Sarna. He's a professor of American Jewish history and director of the Shusterman Center of Israel Studies at Brandeis University. And he's regarded as one of the most prominent historians, historians of American Judaism. His book, American Judaism, A History, received a National Jewish Book Award. And I'm Danielle Whale. I was born in Brazil. And I'm a writer and illustrator for, for children's books. About six years ago, I began to research the story of the Jews from Recife who arrived in New Amsterdam from Brazil. I absolutely fell in love with the topic. And now I'm a Sephiroth adept. <laughs> My book, The Diary of Esther Levy, First Jewish Citizen of New York, launched in March of this year. Um, so we will start our discussion because we are very tight on our time and I want everybody to speak. I'm gonna ask um, the panelists questions and I'm hoping that we can stay under two minutes for each answer. Um, also, if any of the pa other panelists who weren't asked want to add anything to the answers, they're very welcome to do so. Just wait till the end of the answer and then we can complement it with more information. So my first question is for Andre. And um, we don't really know uh, where exactly all, um, when the Sephardim arrived in the Iberian Peninsula. Some people think they arrived in biblical times, but it seems like the first archeological clues date back to the fourth century. Can you give us some context as to the number of Jews that lived in that area? Uh, yes, uh, let me first uh, make a couple of observations. Uh, first of all, I wouldn't call them Sephardic Jews when they arrived in biblical or post-biblical times, because at that point in time, there was no uh, difference between the Sephardim and Ashkenazim. They were just Jews. And the reason a lot of them came to a place like the Iberian Peninsula was initially uh, less to do with persecution and more to do with trade, because we do know that they were very active in trade along the rim of the Mediterranean uh, and that they uh, used to leave behind a small number of other Jews uh, to act as agents in the place they were and to handle whatever needed to be handled for their trade. Uh, so I don't think it was uh, exceptional that they uh, uh, landed and started communities in uh, the Iberian Peninsula, because that would have been part of the whole rim of the Mediterranean. Um, do we know whether they arrived before the fourth century? No, but probably they did if we know they were trading before the fourth century. And certainly I think that's been documented. Uh, sometimes it takes a long time to find an archeological item that will uh, at least date the earliest that we know for sure that they were there. Uh, so, as far as numbers are concerned, uh, I personally have a very great caution that I always give about numbers because I think that we can't really know numbers the way we do today. Often in those days they would start by numbering households rather than individuals like we do now. 
So I would be very cautious about saying there were a hundred there or a thousand there. My hunch would be there were no ever more in the original uh, settlements, less than a hundred, I would think. Uh, but they probably lived together, but maybe not even in the same place. Maybe there were two or three of these small trading communities throughout. Okay. Um, does anyone have anything else to add to that? Okay. Um, for uh, Dr. Gerber, can you give people a quick uh, Inquisition 101 and how that affected the Jews? <coughs> Uh, the Inquisition, I think, has in many ways not only shaped the fate and the tale of the Sephardic Jews, but in some ways it's even distorted it. The Inquisition was initially not founded to persecute Jews. It was founded in the 13th century uh, by the Dominican order, by the, the Vatican and the Dominican order to be the eyes and ears of the church and to inquire into the orthodoxy of believers. By extension in the 13th century, it began to supervise or survey what Jews were believing because at that time there was, it was called to their attention that there were conflicts within the Jewish community about normative Judaism, about philosophy, philosophy versus mysticism. And it was, as we know, a supervisor of thought and of religious thought. It didn't affect the Jews completely or didn't look at the Jews until the 15th century because in 1391, a huge pogrom in Spain, the, in the length and breadth of Spain, Portugal, Majorca, brought in its midst, or as a result of that pogrom, about 100,000 Jews were murdered, about 100,000 Jews forcibly converted, and about 100,000 Jews were managed to evade the wrath of the mobs and remain Jewish. And so the question arose, throughout the 15th century, who was a Jew? Because those who were forcibly converted were not necessarily immediately Christians just because they had been forcibly baptized. And many of them tried to make their peace with a new identity. Many of them attempted to remain Jewish in a, in a clandestine way. The upshot was finally, because nobody knew who was who, that an inquisition nationally was established in Spain in 1478. That inquisition was the guide and the key to persuading the king and queen. And this was then the, in, the inquisitorial authorities to expel the Jews so that practicing Jews could no longer influence or corrupt or pervert those Christians who had once been Jewish and might be secretly exercising certain modified forms of Judaism to remain Jewish. Thank you. That's 101 in a nutshell. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, we'll continue talking a little bit more about the Inquisition. Um, this question is for Joseph. People think of the Holocaust as the big, big, big moment in history for a Jewish diaspora. Can you shed some light as to the enormity of the diaspora that happened because of the Inquisition? Yeah, well, the, the, what happened after uh, the situation that Jane set, sets up for us, <coughs> excuse me, it, you know, is that uh, Isabella and Ferdinand in 1492 expelled the Jews from their kingdom they wanted a, a totally Catholic realm, and it was to protect the Catholic soul. Um, and, and that included the converts from Judaism who had taken on the cloak of Catholicism and to keep them from backsliding. Um, so as huge an event as the Holocaust was, and, and of course, no one in present day can, you know, can, can deny the, the, the effect that it had on the world, 
the expulsion of the Jews from, um, from Spain and Portugal um, had a, um, a huge effect as well. And it literally changed the world and changed the face of the world because it occurred during the age of exploration. And people came from, um, many of the people looking for opportunity, but also perhaps looking to get as far away from the inquisition, uh, jumped on ships and headed for, um, headed for the, the newly founded Americas. And it is estimated that uh, at least 25% of the early colonists of Latin America were, um, were from recent, very recently converted uh, Jewish families. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, does anyone else want to share like uh, some of the different locations in the world that these Jews ended up in? I think one thing that we should point out at this point is that the majority who were expelled in 1492 went not to the New World, but to Portugal. But in Portugal, by 1497, the king, the new king, King Manuel, wanted to <clears> marry <throat> the, uh, the daughter of Ferdinand and Isabella. Stipulation of that marriage was that Portugal too, if it was going to eventually unite with Spain, must be rid of all its Jews. But Manuel wanted these dynamic, exciting, talented, urban Jews to remain. He had no conversos or converts there. And so when the decree of expulsion of the newcomers, the stalwart from Spain, arrive in Portugal and decide to set their roots in, in the ground in Portugal, they find they are in 1496 expelled. When the time for expulsion comes, they're not enough allowed to leave. And so this was the main dynamic the Portuguese Jews who had to leave, who were not allowed to leave, who had been the stalwarts in Spain, who had left Spain in order to be Jewish, and therefore those who had <clears throat> with resilience, with heroism, with trauma to remain Jews, were forced to go underground and find routes to get out. So the explorers, whether they were Spaniards or particularly Portuguese, were those who included in their midst clandestine Jews, those helping them, those trying to establish an underground railroad to get out wherever they could to maintain, to seek anonymity and maintain their identity. Dr. Kerber. Can I, you think, can I throw just one tiny thing in here? Uh, one of the reasons that the Jews were so valuable to the various crowns was that they were literate and numerate, and um, which most of the population was not. And it allowed them to be that much more successful in, uh, in terms of commerce and trade. That's a good point. And we're gonna talk about that in a little bit. Um, Dr. Gerber, um, my next question was for you as well. Um, and it's about the converts. So it's the continuity and what you were saying. So 50, 100, 200 years down the line of Jews converting, I like to think of the state of converted or exiled Jews as a spectrum of Jewishness. Can you give some examples of the range of how, Jew, how, how Jewish people were or weren't maybe 100, 200 years down the line? Well, I, th I think without saying what is Jewish, we have to understand that in the 16th century, in the 15th century, the question was asked by different people. Those who were asking who, what and who is a Jew in 15th century Spain were different from those asking in 16th century and those asking who were in the inquisitional courts seeking out signs of Jewishness signs of Judaizing. You could, in fact, demonstrate signs of Judaizing without being Jewish. You might not like to eat um, cooked food that's made with lard because it, you had never done that. You might have learned to 
sweep your room, the room of your house with the sweeping the dirt into the center of the room. But that became a sign of Judaizing. You might after, as we know today in parts of Majorca, in places still in Portugal, in October, in the middle of uh, October, you could have a card fest, a card tournament outside your home, which 400 years before that had been a cloak for people having Konidre, having Yom Kippur in their home. So practices had to change. Practices sometimes change because people were trying to maintain their observance and sometimes simply because it had been habit, it had been part of life. And as time progresses, Jews or former Jews or descendants of Jews who no longer live in community retain shards of what once was, memories of memories of memories, approximations of what they had heard. And so it was a religion of approximation that becomes that dispersion of the converso. Well said, that's well said. Does anyone want to add anything to that? Okay. The one thing I should, I think though that we should emphasize, Daniela, yeah. is that those Jews who are Jews who remain Jewish are become a separate entity by, by the nature of things, by the forces of history, from these separate, isolated, clandestine, underground uh, people in, in many cases. Coming together to form communities is a different thing. Right. Um, yes, I want to uh, start heading into the Jews that made it to Holland because it's an important part of our story. And, um, and I do know from my reading that um, the ones who arrived there and became openly Jews because they were allowed to in Holland, um, even many of those had to relearn all their Jewish traditions, which they had lost. They had learned how to, they had to learn how to speak Hebrew again, how to read the Torah, all of that. Um, so it was a process for them too. Um, and what I wanted to ask Andre is, um, I think it's interesting that in Amsterdam, there was a little bit of a coming together between the Ashkenazim and the Sephardim because they were both, both these groups were accepted in, in Holland because of the tolerance. Um, and there's, there's always been some kind of classism between the Ashkenazim and the Sephardim, but I'd like you to explain how it was at that time because nowadays there seems to be a a notion that the Ashkenazim are the sort of successful businessmen and not so much the Sephardim, but can you tell us how it was back then in Amsterdam? Yes, um, in Amsterdam, the Jews that started the community there when they were allowed to do by the Protestants, which was the beginning of the uh, 17, uh, 1600s, the 17th century, um, were primarily ex uh, converso. They had gone through a converso stage when they had been ostensibly Catholics. Uh, they were extremely uh, successful as merchants to the extent that, which I'm sure, Daniela, you, you began with, um, they were able to persuade Peter Stuyvesant in New York when 23 of them arrived on those shores <laughs> and keep them there rather than to send them anywhere else, which Stuyvesant had wanted to do. So they were um, uh, very well healed. They were wealthy. They were well known. Um, they had uh, developed their own congregation and they had a very strict um, rules and regs for that congregation in order to bring, as you said, the Jews back to, or these conversos back to a form of Judaism uh, that we recognize today. Uh, and then all of a sudden, well, not quite all of a sudden, but gradually, uh, Jews were beginning, you're right, to trickle in from uh, Eastern Europe and from the Germanic states, where they were undergoing quite a bit of persecution. Um, and uh, those Jews were a lot poorer. 
And uh, although they probably knew more about Judaism than the ex-conversos, they were poor and the congregation was terrified that they were going to bring um, a bad reputation to these successful Sephardic Jews. Um, and uh, they said, what can we do with these people? Oh my, oh my. And they did two things. One thing was they gave them money to go back to where they came from, if they were willing. And the second thing is that they sent some of them packing to the New World, um, uh, paid for their passage and so forth. And so that also began the very earliest uh, arrivals of Ashkenazim in the New World, in the Caribbean and uh, other places um, where they could settle, um, except that they couldn't settle in the New World in the Spanish uh, dominated islands uh, because of the Inquisition problem. So they went to the places controlled by England and France and uh, uh, mainly Holland. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. Uh, I'm going to try to jump ahead now and um, talk about the, the um, significance of Amsterdam in, into the end of the Sephardic Jews. And um, Dr. Gerber, can you kind of unite those two stories of what's, what's the What's the bond between Amsterdam, the, the Jews, and coming to the New World? It's a very uh, exciting, very complicated, and very colorful story. Uh, the story of the coming to the New World really extends beyond Amsterdam to the presence or the drifting in of Jews to all the colonies, the colonies meaning the possessions, the outposts of the French, of the British, of the Spanish, of the Portuguese, of the Dutch and the Danish. So we're talking about the scattering of Jews from Portugal into the Caribbean, into South America, uh, among of Portuguese Jews who, by the way, as we know, one of the reasons they were such attractive kinds of uh, settlers from the point of view of the Europeans was in fact that they were dispersed everywhere. They not only knew a couple of languages, understood what was going on in commerce everywhere, but they had relatives everywhere. So that if business could in fact uh, prevail and trade and the triangular trade, as we'll see uh, from America, from North America to London, to Amsterdam, to the Caribbean was very dynamic. This uh, is beginning with the uh, mid 17th, 18th century. One reason Holland played such an important role was not only that in the 17th century, it was one of the prime mercantile nations in the world, but also the innovations, Jonathan Israel has pointed out some very fascinating details about the maritime innovations that enabled the ships, the Dutch ships to go into some of these lagoons and the inlets and ports uh, to set up a great colony of trade in Curacao, then also an important plantation colony in Suriname and uh, these were all in contact. If we think of the Caribbean map, we know that the Spartac Jews were less uh, nationalistic in terms of feeling they could only trade with Britain or if they were in a British colony. They were a network or family of Spartac traders with each other, with Holland in Europe, with Bordeaux, Holland, uh, lesser, so, uh, so uh, uh, Livorno, Bayonne, of, of important ports. They were port Jews. Thank you. Um, Joseph, I saw in your movie that you visited Hesifi, and I'd just like to get in that um, about the arrival of the, about the, the, the colonial Jerusalem that was happening in Hesifi, and that's going to be the starting point for our story of how the Jews got to uh, North America. Can you just share a little bit about um, Hesifi? Sure. 
Uh, well, one of the characters in our film is a guy named Carlos Medeiros, uh, who is a former seminarian in uh, Brazil, who found out that he was uh, coming from a very religious Catholic family, who discovered that he was descended from one of the um, uh, one of the most notorious victims of the, of the Portuguese Inquisition, a woman named Branca Dias, who had escaped the dungeons of the, um, of the Inquisition, had come to uh, Brazil uh, to follow her husband who was working in the sugar trade as many Jews did. And um, uh, when the, the sugar trade was, was, was vast in, the, um, in Brazil and making a great deal of money and the Dutch West India Company um, wanted a bigger share of it than it had. And in 1630, it conquered the Northeast part of Brazil. And all of a sudden they had a Portuguese speaking country, rich with sugar, and they needed business people who spoke Portuguese. What's better than a converso who come up, had come up from, um, from Portugal. So, uh, so a lot of the, uh, the conversos came to uh, Recife uh, to work and so, so many that they built a very beautiful synagogue, uh, which of course we, we, we visited in the film. <coughs> So, pardon? there were two synagogues there at the time. I mean, ah. that's surrounded by Inquisition, which I think is just fascinating. Fascinating. Yeah. But uh, this only lasted for um, uh, for twenty four years. The Portuguese um, reconquered the area, and they were kind enough to give the Dutch and their Jews um, a couple of months to get out. And uh, there was a, sh and, and so they some went back to Holland. Uh, yeah. Some went back to um, to the other parts parts of the Caribbean, and one ship got off course carrying 23 uh, families of uh, people from Recife, and they wandered up in uh, a northern port called New Amsterdam. I'm gonna have uh, Dr. Sarna talk a little bit about this story too. Um, Dr. Sarna, let's talk about 1654 is that's a really important year and it changed the whole <laughs> um it, it was a whole new diaspora going on in the caribbean and we have the wonderful arrival of the wonderful story of the arrival of the jews in new york can you tell us that story a little bit so, so 1654 uh recife falls to the portuguese who reconquer it uh, it is far and away the largest uh, uh, Jewish community in the New World. And there is really uh, a Recife diaspora. Uh, the Jews leave, as Joseph said, some go back to Holland. Uh, Holland actually is quite eager to uh, return them to the New World. Uh, many moved to the Caribbean, and if you look at different Caribbean communities, many of them see a big growth of population after 1654, and you have a very small number, uh, the traditional number is 23, who end up in what is really the furthest reach of the Dutch Empire in the New World, and that is um, New Amsterdam. So when we look at uh, North America, we say that the beginning of Jewish communal settlement, meaning Jews self-conscious, self-identifying, public about their being Jews, those Jews uh, come to New Amsterdam Peter Stuyvesant, who is the Dutch governor of New Amsterdam, like many governors, uh, he thought the ideal would be if everybody shared the same religion. His job was to keep order. There already, from his perspective, were too many folks in New Amsterdam who were not Dutch Calvinists. Um, indeed, Peter Stuyvesant uh, deeply oppresses the Quakers uh, as well, and uh, he wants to keep the Jews out and um, has very negative uh, things to say about the Jews, and the Dutch Calvinist ministers are happy to agree. However, 
Uh, and this really shows Sephardic solidarity. The Jews are clearly in touch with their fellow Sfaradim back in Holland. Uh, some of those uh, Sfaradim were actually investors in the Dutch West India Company. Others had influence uh, with the Dutch West India Company. The Dutch West India Company employed uh, Peter Stuyvesant. And so although uh, uh, Peter Stuyvesant um, uh, endeavors in his correspondence to uh, persuade them why they should force the Jews um, uh, to go elsewhere. Um, I, the, uh, that doesn't happen. The Dutch West India Company allows them to remain, to trade, uh, to travel, and so on. And as Peter Stuyvesant well understood, this wasn't just a decision about Jews. This was a decision about the whole character of, uh, of, of New Amsterdam, uh, later of New York, uh, that it would be pluralistic rather than rigidly monolithic. Within 10 years, in 1664, uh, New Amsterdam is going to fall to the British. Uh, it's going to become New York. But the British largely maintain the Dutch practice um, and uh, New York, very, very different than say Boston, New York is our most pluralistic North American uh, colony with many languages, with many religions. And I think that made it easier to build a Jewish community uh, uh, there. Uh, and it was a community aided by the Dutch and later uh, part of a Dutch community, of a larger Sephardic world with lots of people traveling to other Sephardic communities in the New World. I'm just going to um, interject a little bit here to say that, you know, the, the congregation that was formed in 1654 in New York by these Jews that arrived is still operating today. It's uh, Sherit Israel. And I also uh, wanted you to talk about uh, another very early congregation in the northeast coast of the United States, which was Congregation Jeshuat Israel. Can you explain sure. to us very quickly what that was? Sure. First of all, it's important to know, we imagine Jews arrived, they must have wanted to pray, they formed a congregation. Of course, they don't have the right to form a public congregation, and we don't have any evidence of group prayer in public until the very end of the 17th century. Uh, the earlier is an assumption. Um, now, the Newport, although there were roots in Newport very early, Newport really gets going in the 18th century. It's a free port. Um, it um, becomes very significant for various kinds of trades from seti oil and so on. Uh, and in the 1750s, um, we see significant Jewish merchants. The most important is Aaron Lopez, also his father-in-law. Uh, these were Jews who came from the Iberian, uh, from the Iberian Peninsula. So they had been living underground as Jews for several hundred years. They come to Newport. They come out of the closet, so to speak. Uh, Duarte Lopez becomes Aaron Lopez, and he does fabulously well. In 1763, this well-established uh, community in Newport, having, having uh, collected money and uh, done very well, uh, they decide to build a synagogue. They have faith in that community, and they build... Uh, uh, Yeshuat Israel Synagogue using the great uh, Newport architect, um, uh, Peter Harrison. It's uh, in a way anyone who goes can see how they modeled it after Amsterdam's um, uh, a synagogue, much smaller, 
It has appropriate sacred measurements, important to the Sephardic view of a synagogue. Note well, unlike in Amsterdam where the Ashkenazim and Sephardim are separate, in the Turo synagogue as earlier in Cherith Israel, Ashkenazim and Sephardim worship together. That's going to be the case until 1825. But the Newport community is a very important community until the American Revolution. Uh, Newport is occupied during the revolution. It never, uh, it ceases to be a free port. Uh, the British uh, cut off the trade that had been key to Newport. And so um, early in the 19th century, uh, Newport doesn't have any Jews, but the Turo family, first Abraham and then Judah, they were the children of the Chazan of Newport. They give money for what is in fact the first example of historic preservation in the history of the United States. They preserve that synagogue. It is known forever after as the Turo synagogue because of their funding. And much later, um, uh, first in summer and then, then year round, the synagogue will be reopened. It is today the oldest um, synagogue building um, uh, in the, uh, continuously in the United States. Thank you so much for that explanation. Um, we just have a few more questions before we take this to Q&A. I wanted to, oh, yes. Um, Andrew, I just wanted to add uh, uh, that um, Luis Moses Gomez, whose original house, one of the houses, is in Marlborough, New York, up the Hudson River. It's the only house museum today when we talk of preservation, Jonathan, which was built by a merchant Sephardic Jew who came here in colonial times. He came in 1700 approximately. Uh, and a lot of the story is available to anybody who is uh, able to take a trip maybe this summer, uh, about an hour uh, from New York up the Hudson. Uh, 9W is the route uh, and to see the house and the story of the house, which essentially is the story of one of the first Sephardic um, Jewish merchants uh, to trade in the New York area um, as the colony grew. Um, and uh, his story is the story that we're talking about today because they traded all over. They traded with the South, they traded with Europe and so forth. But that's available uh, to anybody who is able to go up there this summer. Thank you so much for adding that. Uh, Jonathan, um, I was wondering, or Dr. Sarno, I was wondering, why do you think that the um, this? Why do you think that the story of the original settlers, which were Sephardic, were was for, forgotten? Well, I think that the the story of the original Jews who come to New Amsterdam is really only published at the end of the 19th century. Uh, documents are found curiously, many of those documents, good they were published because they burned in, uh, in Albany, but uh, the, the story was not put together and it's not clear to me that it was known uh, um, uh, to Jews in the early 19th century. The reason it was forgotten was that every one of those early Jews, with the single exception of Asher Levi, leaves. And it's easy to understand why they leave when uh, they see there's going to, they think, hostilities between uh, England and Holland. Uh, they go to sunnier climes, a reminder of how mobile these Jews uh, were. Um, and Asher Levy, and it re remains, we, we know he had significant descendants. It's only after uh, the British are there for a while that we see, uh, again, Jews coming, both uh, uh, Sfaradim, but actually Jacob Marcus showed many years ago 
that the community probably was majority Ashkenazi as early as 1720, but many, and there was much marriage between Ashkenazim and Sfaradim, something you do not much see in places like Amsterdam and London at that time. Uh, but many of the Ashkenazim were Sephardized, meaning they uh, were very proud of the uh, Sephardi heritage that uh, was a percentage of their background, say someone like the early American Mordecai Noah, the leading Jew from uh, the first half of the 19th century. He's only a quarter Sephardi, but he mostly talks about his Sephardic ancestors of whom he was very proud. Um, but in any case, that's why I think the story was forgotten. Um, and, they, and they married, and they they married a lot of them. Those early ones were so successful and assimilated that they married into the uh, Protestant uh, or non-Jewish community. Um, I think Jane, you have mentioned it, or Joseph before. Um, yeah, Joseph, um, I want to. You said something very interesting to me when we were talking before, and I sort of want to end with, um, you know, talking a little bit about the Jews that are not these openly Jewish people that arrived um, from the Caribbean and to the northeast of uh, the American continent, but the ones that came into America as crypto Jews or hidden Jews. Right. who may or may not have known that they were Jewish, like we discussed before, and, and entered the American territory through the South, through um, the Southwest. Yeah. And can you tell me a little bit about that and what was the big aha moment that you had when you made your film about these people? Well, I had always heard about the uh, crypto Jews of the American Southwest. And... Um, and I, I knew about the Sephardic experience um, and making the film was, it was a total, um, you know, journey of discovery. I mean, it was just, it was just one, you know, gobsmacked moment after another. I mean, Jane Gerber took me to places that and, and introduced me to people that, um, that just totally changed my view of the world, totally changed my, of the Jewish world, certainly, and, um, and of the diversity of the Jewish people. And, um, and um, it was a uh, it was it was a, it was a great illumination. Um, the 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 Jews that came from, to the American or, or the crypto Jews that came uh, conversos and crypto Jews that came to the American Southwest. Um, many of them were uh, uh, were trying to avoid the Inquisition that that came to Mexico. Uh, many people uh, were stunned to find out in the when they watched the film that the Inquisition followed, uh, followed um, people all the way to the New World and, uh, and, set, up, um, and, and set up inquiries in, in Brazil and, um, and um, in Colombia and Peru and Mexico City. And Mexico City was, in, in Brazil, they would take people back to Portugal all the way to be um, interrogated, tortured, and, and perhaps executed. Um, but in, in Mexico, uh, they had a full, full raging inquisition, and it was um, it was quite something. And um, it was for, uh, whether I don't know how many people were actually killed, but an inquisition is terrifying. And people would leave the um, uh, would try to leave the Mexico City area and try to get as far away as they could. This this is true in other areas of the where inquisitions were set up and people would go head off into the hinterlands. It happened in Brazil, it happened uh, from Colombia, it happened all over. And um, so one of the places that was not very hus not, not wasn't a very hospitable la landscape was what became the American Southwest. And many people headed up there and, and, and in, um, uh, you will find in, in New Mexico, you will find um, cemeteries uh, of quote, Catholic people where that not a cross is seen. Um, and and, and uh, there are all these stories about people who do not have, um, although they're Catholic, there's never a priest at the family 
funeral. Uh, this they never go to church. They don't do this. They don't do that. They don't do the other. And uh, often there are secrets that are that are given from one generation to the next, to one person in the next. Some and, of the uh, it's fascinating. Yeah, some of the things Dr. Gerber talked about before, about the way you sweep, about the way you treat mm -hmm. the dead, the foods you eat, the foods you don't eat, all these things come up in the American Southwest as well. Yeah. Um, it's fascinating to talk all about, about all of this, but I feel like we need to give our, our audience <laughs> um, an opportunity to ask some questions. So maybe we can talk about some more through the questions. Um, so let me take a look here. Um, somebody's asking, what's the difference between Converso and Crypto? Um, I'll take that. Okay. Um, not all the uh, Jews that were converted uh, or forced to be converted on the Iberian Peninsula maintained over the generations any semblance of Jewish life. They sometimes uh, preferred even to marry into the old Christian community to expunge what we would call today bad blood, Jewish blood. Others felt completely different and they were more interested in uh, um, maintaining their Jewish ethnic heritage and so they took it underground with others who felt the same way. So the, the difference is that a crypto Jew is still uh, maintaining a semblance of Jewish ritual and Jewish life. A converse Converso could be somebody who was converted, but didn't necessarily uh, continue Jewish life. To complicate well, the problem, Rick, sorry, Jane, go ahead. I just add to that correct definition that those who were secretly maintaining Judaism were sometimes known as Maranos, and that was a derogatory term that was used. And the problem for the outsider was you didn't know who any of these people were uh, in, in, internally or in their homes. In Hebrew, we didn't make that distinction, or the rabbis didn't make it a few hundred years ago. They uh, initially were all known as Anusim, the forced ones. Yeah. What's also interesting, and, and Jane is the one who's pointed this out to me, is that whether you were a sincere convert or not, you were still suspect of, um, of, of, of backsliding and of Judaizing. So even if you had made the most sincere conversion, your neighbor could still turn you in and, 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 and get part of your property. Thank you guys for answering that. Um, there's a question here I'm just gonna address real briefly. Um, did Jews participate in the slave trade? And I'm gonna make this answer very short for now, which is yes. But I also wanna, you know, uh, tell you guys all that we're gonna have a whole other discussion just about this topic. Um, it'll be scheduled for sometime in the near future. So we don't wanna go down too much into that rabbit hole, but the short answer is yes. And, um, let me see here. Um, what percentage of Caribbean, South, and Central American people have significant Jewish genealogy without even being aware of it? Does anyone know how to answer that? Very difficult to answer questions about what people have that they don't know and ascribe Judaism uh, can kind of get you into trouble. Uh, of course, there remain uh, significant descendants in the Protestant Caribbean communities of old Western Svaradim with famous Jewish names and, uh, uh, and so on. But the secret Jews who haven't come out of the closet, who had ancestors who were once Jewish, um, very, very difficult, uh, really, uh, uh, to know, and no numbers, I think, are likely to be accurate. Um, People I've spoken to in Brazil have said, um, they feel that, that 25% is a very conservative figure. Yeah, I of, got uh, it. Of people carrying Jewish, Jewish DNA. 
Um, I have a question here. Someone posted, um, when did the term Sephardim or Sephardic start being used? Well, the term Sephardic actually is found in the Bible. And it's then, it's Avadia, I think, it's ascribed uh, to uh, Spain quite early. And uh, Jane knows, knows the most about that, but it's an early term um, uh, that is understood by Jews uh, to refer to that, to, to, uh, to, to Spain. Um. Can I add to that you, um, just briefly? Um, I understood uh, the difference between the uh, Sephardim and Ashkenazim or the expressions or the way where they settled to do also with the, who settled in the Muslim countries and who settled in the Christian countries uh, very early on in the Middle Ages. Jane, do you want to add? I'm sorry. Uh, that, yeah, let me modify that because when the Jews themselves in their wanderings settled around the Mediterranean, the Sepharad was or was not used as a term at that point. We, we begin to hear in the in the ninth century, then in the 10th century, that the term Sepharad is used by Jews to distinguish them, and it's associated specifically with Spain to associate them with the Iberian Peninsula, or to describe Iberian Jewry as Yehude Sfarad. Initially, Sfarad in the Bible probably referred to a place in Asia Minor. The, uh, when Moses Maimonides in the 12th century signed his letter as Moshe ben Maimon HaSfaradi, clearly he, and he signed the, these letters in Egypt after fleeing from Morocco and fleeing from Spain, the quality of Hasfaradi meant something more than a piece of geography. It referred to a certain mode of thinking, a mode of um, codifying of the exegesis of the Bible, of how one in Spain lived, ver not versus because there was no rivalry, but the larger Mediterranean uh, Jewry under Islam, including Sephardic Jews in Muslim Spain, all shared a culture that was in many ways uh, derivative from Baghdad, from Babylonia. The distinctions are not uh, between Jews of Islam and Jews of Spain. Spain is an embodiment of some of the traits and an exaggeration, you could say, or an embellishment if some of the traits it all shared. Now, in the dispersion of this community of um, it, throughout the Mediterranean, throughout the Middle Ages, the Jews of the Mediterranean, whether it was under Islam in Spain or in North Africa, had many affinities. So today, in the uh, though Sfar Sfarad, Sephardic meanings changed, Sephardic Jews from Spain and Portugal, Jews from Muslim lands share a great deal that they can feel comfortable together and at home in their rituals in their community. Thank you but they're separate communities. Yeah. yeah. I, excuse just... me, I think it's important also to point out that um, you know, this distinction, you know, human beings seem to go out of their way to find distinctions um, uh, uh, a bit, a bit, uh, that, that separate us one from the other. And um, the Sephardim and the Ashkenazim, uh, uh, as we point out in, in the film with the migration patterns, um, you know, people traveled from Spain to Italy to Austria and then to East Europe and, and, and wound up in shtetls where all their neighbors came with, came with them. And were they Sephardim or Ashkenazim? And, uh, and then people intermarried, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it gets a little loosey-goosey. You know, it's, as Jane says, it's really more cultural and, than it is who you, you know, where, where you came from originally. And in my, uh, in my research, I found uh, that at the time that we're talking about, um, I think that the terms that were used for the Jews were people of the nation. Um, mm -hmm. That was a very common term, and also the Portuguese 
Uh, I mean, that, that was almost, uh, or the Portugal's, that was almost Cold War, Cold War. Portuguese merchant, Portuguese right. Portuguese merchants. Nation. Um, Ari, do we have, uh, should we carry on with questions or should I uh, pass it to Michael now for closing remarks? Uh, Michael should come on shortly. There we go. Okay, great. Well, um, let me thank all of the, the panelists. I'm sorry that we didn't have time to get to all the questions. It's such a short time for everyone, but we'll do more of these. And uh, Michael, um, it's microphone's yours. Okay, so once again, I'd like to thank everyone for your participation and your interest. Jewish Heritage Alliance is a platform comprised of alliance partners spanning the globe. The Alliance allows us to expand our reach and broaden our scope, <coughs> creating a voice of the collective. One example of our partnership is with the Museum of the Jewish People at Beit Pusot, a respected global institution focusing on telling the story of the Jewish people, one of our co-hosts here today. Working together with the Portuguese government and the tourist offices of Porto in Northern Portugal, we created a mobile exhibit called At the Crossroads of Sepharad, and the footsteps of the crypto Jews. The mobility of the exhibit allows us to promote the story of Sarad on a global scale. Due to COVID-19, we are offering an online version of the exhibit, which we will make available to all the participants here today. I'd like to close where I began. This Farad segment of Jewish history did not and does not have the same coverage or attention as the European or biblical Jewry. We invite each and every one of you to join us on future presentations where we uncover the extensive, far-reaching Jewish heritage of this period. Thank you for your participation and hope to see you on our next webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure.